All right, Blake, we uh, another awesome episode. One of the best ever. I think it's the best. <laughs> I think it's the best one. No one's going to catch on that these <laughs> these ads go on all the all the episodes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but before we get into it, just a quick little rundown of the companies that we work with that have helped support Through the Noise and really appreciate their Thank support. Thank you very much. Infogroup.com, we've talked about them. Um, they help with direct mail, optimizing direct mail lists, creating mailing lists, uh, managing them carefully and helping you understand the intricacies. And it is an intricate process. If you're just sort of throwing uh, email addresses and addresses of people that you think might want to be members of your association or, or, or potential donors to your nonprofit, then you're probably kind of just sort of throwing them in a bucket and you're not being very... Wasting um, time? Yeah, you could be wasting time and resources sort of mailing things to people that don't want to be mailed, don't want to hear from you. So um, they have lots of ways. They have something called a, I think it's, what is it, a relationship database? It's sort of like a relational they, they help Collaboration. You, a collaborative it? database, right, that they help you understand if you have somebody in your mailing list, what is the best way, what is the best message, what is the thing that that person particularly responds to? Yeah. And then stop sending them it's stuff. It's not scary. That Everyone hears that yeah. and they get scared. Yeah, it's not. So episode 181, 181. Uh, you have Stephanie kind of give, doing a deeper dive. Um, but if you're wondering, just give them a ring, uh, infogroup.com. Infogroup.com. Now, here's an interesting thing. I was talking to Paul. So say you're a small nonprofit, right? Okay. <laughs> you ready for this? Yeah. Say you're a small nonprofit and um, you find out that someone is licking another employee's sandwich. What? <laughs> now, you don't have an HR person. Who does this? I don't know, but Paula was telling me in publishing that this was happening at a nonprofit. That is... Oh, kissing. kissing, not kissing. licking. Kissing, I'm that's told still, from the control room. That's still just as bad. It's weird. Yeah. It's weird. So what would you do? You don't have an HR person. Now you've got to deal with this. Do you call a lawyer? You start freaking out because how do you approach the person? You're like, hey, man, um, you you shouldn't. You can't be kissing people's sandwiches. I know, but can they say it's my right? Uh, like, 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 who knows? This is why you need UST, <laughs> right? Okay. Yes. Unser- unemployment Services Trust. Trust. Right. So not only did they... Um, take the money that you'd have to give to the government for your unemployment taxes and put that in a special fund for you. They also they also will um, have an HR department there have for a, you. They have an HR hotline. A hotline. You, actually have, you can call somebody that's an HR professional that probably has heard similar crazy stories like that. Yeah. Uh, and, and they'll they tell you, okay, you here's how it. you do this. Or maybe you're going to let them go. Here's the ramifications. But you also have the fun there. And they'll help you find a new person to get rid of the kissing <laughs> sandwich person. They'll help you manage find, that person manage out. Manage that problem out. So it's not just that, that law thing where the nonprofits get a better um, deal. Get a better deal. They also get the HR department, job placement, all that kind of stuff too. So if um, don't let employees kiss sandwiches in your nonprofit, <laughs> go to go to UST. Choose UST dot org dot org. Episode one seventy five. One seventy five. Yeah. Um, and also, if you're listening to this show and if you're having fun listening to Through the Nose, we try really hard to keep it fun. Um, one of the things that uh, we're doing is we're interested in talking to associations that might be open to the idea of also doing their own show. So, humanfactormedia.com. It's kind, you know, you can do it yourself. You can go get a recorder, give it a shot. And then call us. Yeah, <laughs> because most likely uh, you'll quickly realize that it's a lot more to involved do right. to do it right. Look, if you just correctly. want like just a, a, a blathering podcast, that's cool. There's there's a place for that for sure. But if you really want it done right, where do we go? Humanfactormedia.com. Through the Noise, the business of nonprofits, is sponsored by Infamia and Human Factor Media. And now, your hosts, Blake Alfin and Ernesto Glucksmith. Mm. Yes, Blake, hey, listen. That's right. <laughs> That's what this episode's Hit about. It. We got a little legal gavel. Right what here. is this thing we're doing? This is Through the Noise. I'm Blake Alvin. That's Ernesto Glucksman. Every two times a week, actually, we bring you the hottest two, non Two to three sometimes. The hottest nonprofits, the hottest associations, sexy, 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 right? <laughs> yeah, Blake. And we do the word association game at the end. That's always fun, right? That's true. And we right. sprinkle it with technology. That's right. Is this our new intro? <laughs> it is. It's a, it's a new day. Um, it, listen, we we if you're setting up a nonprofit, there's legal stuff, possible legal pitfalls. Legal world that, um, yeah, that's super scary. 
and therefore you need a good or an association or so the association anybody really you need a good attorney to you know keep you from getting yourself into trouble yeah right I know a guy you know a guy yes let him in yeah hi hello <laughs> how's it going Jeff Good afternoon. We drag you out of Venable. You're the partner, Jeff Tenenbaum. Jeffrey Tenenbaum, uh, partner and uh, chair of the nonprofit practice there at Venable. Do you wish you could hold a gavel sometimes? I do, all the, every day. Every day? Yeah. Well, we have one. <laughs> I may steal it. That's him hitting it right now. Um, can you kill the music? Yep. Like, can you tell us maybe a little bit about <laughs> I don't know if our intro well, is no. awesome or terrible. We met, well, we meet terrible. this young man. Uh, oh, that's right. Uh, Michael Cummings from Tate Cummings. Um, when we taped at ASAE, the American Society for Association Executives, he said well, you were the best lawyer in the nonprofit world. In the world, really. I mean, he did, He said that specifically. My money was well spent. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> that's what we thought. So we really wanted to get to the bottom of how that happens. Um, and why, you know, why uh, Michael had said to swing by, and I really appreciate you stopping by. Yeah, thanks. Thank you guys for having me. How'd you get in the line of work? I mean, obviously you went to law school, but you could have been a, a, a trial attorney. You could have been a, a anything, but you're in the nonprofit sector. You just a do gooder. Um, yes and no. I actually got into this line of work uh, completely by accident, uh, and it's the result of ASAE. Believe it or not. Oh, uh, yeah, that's you know, always those, a problem. Those yeah. folks at ASAE, they are troublemakers. So I um, went to undergrad, Philadelphia, my hometown. Oh, yeah? Came down to Go D Eagles? Go Eagles. Ugh. Huge Eagles. <laughs> Sorry, all the Eagles. DC listeners. Um, came down to work in Capitol Hill for about three years um, for my home district congressman. Loved it. Learned a ton. Always knew I wanted to go to law school, but wasn't sure exactly what area I wanted to specialize in. Okay. Um, Went to law school at night at Catholic University here in D.C. and got a job during the day to pay the bills at ASAE, American Society of Association oh, yeah? Executives. Oh. What were you doing? Um, so the guy who was then the director of um, government relations, a guy named Brian Palish, who would also be a good guy for you to interview. He's over at Brian, American okay. Society of Civil Engineers. Um, he, after I badgered him enough, he hired me as a as an intern and then later as a um, public policy issues analyst, analyzing all the new laws and regulations and other things that affected associations. Is it, is it hard to become an intern at ASAE? It was you said you badgered very him. hard. I think he paid me $8 an hour or something. Wow. Yeah. Uh, got my foot in the door, though, worked my way up, started doing all the issues analysis for all the public policy issues that affect associations, and then later took over managing the legal section, which is where all the lawyers belong that represent associations. All while you're in law school? Yes. All right. It was a very difficult time, but I learned a ton, fell in love with association law and um, mm. associations generally, and by the end of uh, three and a half years when I finished, I knew what I wanted to do. And I've uh, been doing it ever since. That was about 20 right. years ago. So you, you wow. go to law school, you're working at the ASAE, and you probably think you know what you're doing as a lawyer when you get out and you get your, because you've been at ASAE, you're around lawyers this whole time, right? And I was doing, I was writing a lot of analysis of new legal developments. I was putting together um, publications. I was putting together programs, seminars, things like that. So I did learn a lot of the substance and I did feel very well prepared. Did you go straight to the firm? To the, uh, what is Actually, it? I started out at a small firm, worked for a great guy named Steve Fellman over at a firm called Gallen, Karish, and Garfinkel in the Georgetown section of D.C. Um, I really wanted to start out at a smaller firm where I'd have a real ability to, to grow my own practice and be able to delve into and learn all of these different areas of law that affect association. Because association law, there, there, there's no textbook. Here is the body of law hmm. that associations need to deal with. It's really how dozens of different areas of law apply uniquely to associations and other nonprofit organizations. And in big law firms like where I am now, uh, at least traditionally... Let me interrupt you. How big is big? Um, I mean, we're probably 75th biggest firm in the country, about 650 lawyers. 650. The so then that each one has a secretary and all that kind of stuff? All that fun stuff. Okay, so 12. Mine is the best, though. <laughs> Shout out to Cheryl. So thousands of people, <laughs> thousands of people in this firm. Um, yes, it's a okay. very big firm. But when you go to a big firm, they traditionally try to get young associates to be pigeonholed in a certain area of right. law. We need and, you here. And I really Split wanted to, to learn tax exemption issues, uh, political law issues, copyright, trademark, employment, antitrust, contracts, corporate governance, you, know, you name it. 
Um, and I felt like I'd have a better opportunity to do that in a small firm. And that was turned out to be the case. And I was able to build a pretty nice size practice in the first few years. I did a lot of speaking and a lot of writing. I was cranking out several articles every month, giving speaking presentations every other month, and was able to develop a client base of my own and uh, got on the radar screen of Venable and was recruited there. Um, actually, they recruited me two years into it, and I politely declined because I felt it was premature. I said, call me back in a year. And then he, they did. he did and Holy ended up coming over, and that was 17 years ago. Wow. So you've been with the, the Venable ever since? Venable ever since. So, all right, let's go into the, 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 the cheesy question here. So what are, like, in your practice in general or in the association world, what do you see some of the, I don't even know how to ask this in a weird way, the, the legal things that you're seeing that are being done wrong, that you could walk in and be like, problem, problem, problem. Sometimes it's, it's everything. Everything. Uh, <laughs> yeah. It all depends. Yeah. Uh, it, it really depends on um, uh, what I sometimes call the legal health of the association. Um, for instance, um, recently, I mean, this has always happened over the course of my career, but recently we seem to have taken over a lot of new representations, a lot of associations where we are their new general counsel. Um, either they don't have in-house lawyers or they have one or two, but we're the primary outside counsel. And for a number of these, not all of them, but for a number that we've taken over, uh, we've taken over from prior counsel who weren't really steeped in and truly knowledgeable about, about association law. And there has been a lot and is a lot of cleanup to do in almost every area imaginable, from some of the most complex things to some of the most basic things. Let's give a basic one for us two dummies here. Like, so what would be so some let's common say, mistakes? You know, you know, let's say that you, you, you say your association up, you know? has a, a name, a logo. It has a certification program. It has big, unique name of your conference or trade show, yep. or other products or services. That's intellectual property that needs to be protected. Uh, you protect it through copyright trademark law and through trademark law. So some of the basic things that we see, we took over one about two years ago, a number of really key trademarks. They had one federal trademark registration. That was it. Everything else they had was not protected at all through the registration process. doesn't mean that it didn't have trademark rights, but not nearly as well protected as they should have been. So it's a lot of that housekeeping type things, you know, making sure your trademarks are, are properly registered, making sure when you're letting other people use your brands, your logos, your marks, that you're doing it through a written license agreement, making sure that when other people like your members are helping you to create valuable content, educational content, they're speaking at your conferences, writing for your publications, that you're getting a, an appropriate copyright assignment or license of all of that content the waiver, so that you own it and you can do to it. To use somewhere else, right? We just exactly, had that conversation with Exactly. Somebody. These are basic things, but they're, they're critically important. Of course, other things can be equally important and sometimes even riskier. Um, you know, let's say your employee handbook is really out of date and not consistent with kind of the current state of uh, federal and state employment law for whatever state's jurisdiction you have offices. You can create some pretty significant liability exposure for your, for your organization through your policies, through your practices, and not having counsel that's really informed and engaged in that area um, can be a pretty dangerous thing. Um, antitrust laws for the trade and professional associations in particular uh, can be a very, very oh, risky that's area. Right. Uh, Anti-competitive conduct. Yeah, uh, can't uh, talk about pricing. Yeah, yeah exactly. my, pop was a, my pop was a lawyer, uh, still is a lawyer, as a matter mm -hmm. of fact, but he said he'd go sit in meetings at a trade association, yeah. and they pay him his day rate to just sit there. Literally just sit there and, like, and, uh, and listen for the wrong way. I don't know how it works when you say- We do that sometimes. When you well. say money, do you like you know ring a bell? You can't talk about that? Is that what, pretty much what pretty you do? Pretty much. Uh, look, every association has different antitrust sensitivities and risk. Um, some, though, have a long history of problems in this area, and those are the ones where we do um, are asked regularly to sit through through board meetings for that purpose. They got it, in trouble in the past at some point, and so now they're like, well, we need yeah, to. Know. Or the industry just has a history of anti-competitive oh, conduct, of price gotcha. fixing, bid rigging, um, trying to keep competitors out of the market. Um, How, so, after you get nailed once, or, or is it just like, oh, we'll pay? Is it that cost of doing business? We'll just pay the fine and keep going? Um, I mean, how not, do you get a history? Not, not, not generally. And it's not always being dinged. I mean, I have some clients that have gone through FTC, Federal Trade Commission investigations okay. and enforcement action and entered into a consent decree, like a settlement. Um, and 
once you go through that process, you're generally never going to go down that path again. Yeah. But sometimes you might get a one-off lawsuit or something like that 20 years ago. And, and that's history. And then people forget. This, in associations, there's always new members coming on, new board members coming right. on. Right. They, so they're not so well-versed in what they can or can't say. So we do, do a lot of training of board members. Mm -hmm. We do a lot of review of antitrust compliance policies, review of joint ventures and other activities that might give rise to antitrust risk. Hmm. What sort of, I mean, we do bring in a lot of folks from associations. What um, do they have you sometimes tell them, like, what's coming down the pike? What might be some changes in the law that could affect us? They do um, all the time. I always get asked about that. And um, anything, you know, so for instance, we recently? have um, some new um, rules that are coming into, into play from the U.S. Department of Labor uh, that are going to effectively make it a lot harder to characterize certain employees as exempt employees, exempt from the Fair Labor Standards Act, basically the overtime requirements, and are uh, going to force a lot more associations to class reclassify employees from exempt to non-exempt status, meaning they're going to have to pay them time and a half overtime for every hour worked over 40 in a given work week. Can you break down that a little bit for people that don't know about this new yeah, change? Yeah, so um, the Federal Fair Labor Standards Act has a number of provisions in it, but the most notable is the provision that says unless you are exempt from those requirements. That would be a contractor or well, yeah, salary con employee? Con contractors are definitely exempt because they're not employees. That's if they're properly classified as a contractor. That's a whole other area. We'll do that in another show. Non-compliance. <laughs> um, constant non-compliance. But for employees, you're either exempt or non-exempt. So an exempt would be a, a salaried person, typically, Not right? just salaried. Not that's just salaried. One of the requirements is you have to be paid on what's called the salary basis test, meaning you, you get paid a salary as opposed to an hourly wage. But the other part of it is, and it's very complex and way too boring for a fun show like this. Okay. But essentially, it's more of your higher level employees, more of your managers um, who tend to be able to meet the other part of that test to be exempt. Um, but the problem is that that salary test is now about to double um, in, in, in the amount of what you have to pay. Mm. Um, and as a result of that, a lot of employees who otherwise would be would be qualified for the exempt exemption from the Fair Labor Standards Act are not going to be. That's going to have some pretty significant implications for uh, for, for associations. They're going to have to pay a lot more in, in payroll. And think about, too, things like association conferences where you have your, typically you bring all or most of your staff to these conferences. It's an all hands on right, deck. And they go to working a, around the clock. And they and go to a party. and They do it at, yeah. They're working in the morning at the, in a, on the floor of the trade show. A lot of OT. Educational, yeah. And think about all the overtime that, that has to be paid as a result of that. Um, do you, you know, come up with schemes? I hate to use that word scheme. It sounds conniving. But so when you go to the conference, you'll hire local contractors there, but you'll still have to pay them. Is that part of your sometimes? Too? Sometimes some associations. Okay. Do. It's not a scheme. I mean, you're, I know, and you're allowed under the law to manage people's hours to not have to pay them overtime. Like you can right. say you're not allowed to work more than forty hours, and here's how we're going to do it. Okay. Um, it, it, it's not illegal to do that. What's illegal is if they go over that, you do have to pay, pay them. them. And you can, uh, if, you can, and if, you if can, their salary is not at a high enough to be over the certain threshold you're talking about. And if you don't otherwise meet the uh, other you know, requirement the, 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 what, the, what we call the duties test. And that's a whole other area where we constantly find noncompliance. Um, a lot of people wrongly classify employees, even if they meet the salary test, they think they're, they're managing one or two people, and so that's enough. And, and the tests are just a lot stricter and, and more difficult to meet them. Mm. All right. So I, I I don't know how, again, this is one of these questions where it's, I got almost have to say it and then you'll probably get it. Paula, who does our contract stuff for our little podcasting media yep. company here, <clears throat> she does the contracts because she probably should go to law school at this point or get the, take the bar or whatever. Uh, but when we work with a lawyer sometimes, my frustration can be, uh, I love you, Brian, but here I go. Um, it's like here comes the contract and it's nine million pages long and I almost and now I have to go through him and he has to explain all the stuff he put in and why we put it in. And sometimes now this is when we're getting someone to sign something, they want to throw everything in that could possibly happen. And and I'm, I go, Oh my God. Like can someone read this to me? And it it's it's someone be scared to sign it. Yeah. It, it's a, How do you manage that? First off, it's a great question and it's something you never learn in law school. Um, every first year law student takes contracts contract law. That's a class, you know, 101. It, yeah. it, it is a class, but it does nothing to teach you anything that would remotely help you to answer your question or your challenge. So what do you fact, call that? Client management? or? Uh, or? Yeah, it's certainly part of it, but it's much more than that. It's really an art. Um, kind of drafting, reviewing, and negotiating contracts is really an art form. It's not a science. And 
every contract is different in terms of how critically important it is, what provisions in there. You know, for instance, if this is your major um, conference of the year, uh, and, and so you're it's generating 60% of the revenues of the association, you're going to think that the contract with the convention center, with the hotels, with the, the bus companies, with right. the other vendors, things Probably like that, tighter. are, are, are going to be critically important, and you're going to need to build in things to really protect the downside. And you may you know, be going a little more overboard than, for instance, a contract with a local photographer that you're hiring to take pictures right, at a local right. you know, cocktail reception uh, uh, or something yeah, like that. work for hire. And, and so see. Everything's different. You need to understand the importance of the event or the program or the venture. You also need to understand the importance of different provisions in there. And so, for instance, if you're hiring that photographer, making sure there's something in there that says that he or she agrees to transfer the copyright to all of the photos that he or she takes sure. and that you are going to own those after. Because if you don't put that in there, he actually owns the sure. copyright. You don't. You just have a right to use them. It's going to be a one-page document. That's going to be critically important. But having a long choice of law and indemnification and limitation on liability and all the stuff that you don't even know what it means. The, con- the photographer's going to go. It's not very important. It's not important at all, frankly. Um, and so one thing that we've gotten good at, because we've seen this with associations and nonprofits generally, is that they're generally very adverse to long legalistic docu- uh, contracts and other legal documents. And so we've had to get good in our practice at being very focused and practical and making sure we cover the downside risk and protect the rights and whatnot, but don't go overboard, especially where it's not necessary. It's tricky. It's tricky. Have you ever done it? Um, I'm oh, it's just so many different iterations of our contracts with, like, when we were building out custom websites, they were much more involved, yeah. just yeah, web and, applications. And in fact, we have a whole team of folks who work on our technology-related contracts for our association, and really? our profit clients, mm-hmm. and that's a whole different animal. It is a lot more complicated. They're the nerds over in the... They're actually pretty cool. <laughs> ride the short bus. Shout yeah. Out AJ. Um, hey, AJ. They, they, uh, they do tend to... Um, but even to, within... To, to, to be uh, a bit longer, eccentric? more cumbersome, but... Uh, <laughs> AJ's not eccentric. No, but is AJ a, a tech guy at heart, or is yeah, he a he super really lawyer? Is, he really is a tech guy at heart, which is partly what makes him so good at these contracts. Right. So way, you, way, It's way above my head. But... but would he look at what you do and be like, oh, Lord, I can't take what Jeff does over there? Yeah, like, probably if I got into the nuances <laughs> of Section 501c6 of the Federal Tax Code, his eyes would glaze over. Really? Yeah. 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 That's wild. It's like, you know, there's a little universe <laughs> over at uh, over It's Zenable. all technical, right? Uh, yeah, how but, do you but, tech music? But, <laughs> <laughs> but that's it's one of the reasons we've been able to be so successful in our practice is that we've pulled together almost a law firm within a firm. We've got about 650 lawyers across the country, but our association and nonprofit practice is really a core of about 75 lawyers within that who are um, generalists. Uh, a lot of them are generalists in associations and nonprofits generally, and then a number of specialists in every area imaginable. Right. And they all work w- really, really well together, and they all uh, really understand associations. Right, because your generalists will work just generally, and then you bring in the specialists when a particular issue pops up with one one nonprofit. Yeah, or so we're nonprofit. doing a you know a, a basic joint venture agreement, employment agreement or something, but then there's some unique privacy issue or copyright or trademark or tech issue, and then we can tap you know the expertise as appropriate. So what's it like when you're sitting as the chair of the practice, the nonprofit practice? I mean, how does that, what's that like? You meet once a month and you're talking about general trends for the business or the <coughs> sector at large? It's, or? it's not like being a CEO of a company. It's not okay. top down like that. Um, in a lot of ways, it's a, it's a collection of lawyers uh, many of whom, especially the partners in the practice, that have their own practices, but we we do things so much together too. Or, you know, I've been the face of the practice probably more than others for the um, for the most of the time that I've been there. Uh, I do more business development, bring in more clients uh, than others. But I can't ma- manage and handle all of that on my own, um, and so we have a number of key partners that help manage those client relationships right. and the manage onboarding the work product, and then and help to mentor and train Got and oversee it. all of the associates. We spend enormous time on that, and I can't do it all myself. Uh, I wish I could, uh, but we have tremendous people kind of at every level of the uh, uh, of the process. All right, so like, let's talk about. I always thought this was interesting. First, an association. When is it time to, A, get yourself an in-house counsel, and then, B, how could you possibly have an in-house counsel? Is the in-house counsel kind of like the coach on a team, and he, or not even a coach, 
like I would think the analysis council would have to be pretty advisor. darn smart in a lot of mm-hmm. areas, but he might be calling Jeff to say, hey, uh, what's going on with the 5033? Yeah. It, what's the deal with in-house councils? In-house councils. Uh, I work with a lot of them, and, it, and it's really an R. I mean, I, in some ways, I feel like an in-house council myself. I just do it for hundreds of different associations. Because you really have to be a traffic cop. You need to be able to know enough about every major area of law to be able to spot red flags, to be able to, to give quick advice, to be able to know when to go to outside counsel for, for, for more deep expertise, and all doing it, of course, within a very tight legal budget, which every association mm, has. I don't care right. how small or big they are. They're all very fee-sensitive. It's another thing we've had to get very good at, at working at a big law firm, but being very efficient. Um, and being an in-house counsel, it's a really challenging job. And I work with some really, really terrific ones. I work with some others who are kind of new to the game. And I think Why do I need one, though? Better. So why don't I just hire... Uh, Venable. Well, first off, you don't have to have one. I'd say more. When would I need one? Half of our clients probably don't have in-house counsel, and it works very well, Um, especially when you have a firm like ours. It's kind of a one-stop shop, and you have one person who's the relationship partner and can help manage all of that. At the same time, it's expensive, more expensive generally to have outside counsel than in-house counsel. If you're using all the time. If you have the right person or people and are able to do a lot of that work. You know, for instance, if you had to farm out every single contract review and you have hundreds and hundreds of contracts a year, it's probably going to be more efficient if you could have one person in-house. in-house to do most of it. Although that's but not you need always a lawyer? possible. You no, know, it doesn't have to be a lawyer. In fact, some of the best uh, contract reviewers and negotiators for meeting contracts that I've worked with over the years are not lawyers at all. Yeah, you don't want, great meeting plans. You don't want Paula, our guy, <laughs> gal Paul, looking at contracts. And Ernesto can attest to this, and she's going to hear this, too. Oh, so. yeah. Every day. <laughs> Every detail. detail, every sentence, and we have to sit, and she goes down line by line, every piece of word. So, yeah. but as I'm saying, you do not need a law degree to be a great. Uh, so, when do I when do I need a lawyer in house? But I, I will. So, here's some differences, though. Unless you're going to pay a massive amount of money that no association is willing to pay, you can't have your outside lawyer at every staff meeting, at every committee meeting. You know, sometimes yes, at every board meeting, but. Being in the middle of all of that gives a, a, a terrific perspective to be able to raise the red flags, to ask questions and do things that it's just not functionally practical to do with outside counsel. And so, and in addition, when we give advice as outside counsel, this just happened today. It turned out we gave some advice to a client a year ago, maybe it was a year and a half ago. A new person came in to replace the uh, CFO. Turned out that advice was never implemented, um, and that that association doesn't have in-house counsel. Sometimes it can be um, really helpful, effective, and important to have someone on the inside to help make sure the advice from outside counsel gets, counsel gets implemented and applied on the inside, being, not just initially, but on an ongoing basis. Right, right. So is there like a rule of thumb for size? Is it sort of how uh, rambunctious your members are? Like, I'd rambunctious? say size is, yeah. <laughs> some, some are rambunctious. Rambunctious. Um, there they are. <laughs> yeah. We were got to get Venable in-house. Yeah. Because <laughs> these people are out of control. Uh, I wish I could tell you some stuff. <laughs> right. um, I'd say size is the biggest determiner. Of okay. that. Uh, generally, the larger organizations tend to have in-house counsel where a lot of smaller ones don't. But I see exceptions to that. Um, and, and I should also tell you that purposely by design, our practice in the last 10 years or so has really expanded from the association world to the broader nonprofit world, uh, particularly the world of Mm. uh, large public charities, and to the point now where it's probably about 50-50 between associations and all all other types of nonprofits. Look at you, the five O's. 501 C3s generally, the, uh, the so a, a lot of C4s, but everything from large issue based public charities in every area, imaginable private foundations, think tanks, colleges and universities, a, a, um, advocacy groups, arts and cultural institutions like museums, um, some really large, interesting, dynamic organizations out there. Um, and it's really. To me, the, the two most interesting parts of it are, A, the fact that a lot of them get federal funding, a lot of federal mm-hmm. grant money, which is a huge area for complexity and compliance that's, sure. uh, that's really fun one. for the lawyers in the area. And then yeah, the other part is the international expansion. A lot of associations mm-hmm. have expanded internationally, but a lot of these kind of large international NGOs, non-governmental organizations have or have been doing so for much longer and on a much larger scale, and that brings a really interesting array of both domestic and foreign legal, legal and regulatory legal issues. D- interesting how to how to how to get um, how to kind of align that the different legal environments. It's very complicated um, and very difficult and very risky. 
Yeah. So at what point does somebody like a Venable, when you have somebody like, oh, we got a big foundation that does a lot of work in the Congo, um, does that mean suddenly you're going to run out and get a bunch of Congo legal experts to sign up? Yeah, into it's a, a great question. Uh, our firm has adopted a model which is really working well for us where we have um, – about a half dozen U.S. offices. We have no offices overseas, and that's so far at least by design in the growth of our firm. What we do have is a network of local counsel in most countries around the world, sometimes several different firms. Um, and what we've been able to do that we work with very closely, sometimes they're engaged, we connect them with our client and they're working directly. Sometimes we're we're playing a role too, so all, all three parties are involved. But it enables us to really find kind of the best firm or a lawyer or lawyers in each country that have the relevant expertise that we're looking for, as opposed to saying, we have an office there, so you have to work with our lawyers there who may know very little about nonprofits or right. some mm-hmm. of the unique issues there. So it's actually worked really well. And then when you build out that relationship, do you then go, well, we need, you know, we got some mouths to feed. One, one NGO working in the Congo might not be enough consistent business. Let's, let's, we need to find, I mean, how do you prospect for a new client? How do you find new? Well, no, what we're usually working with is a large um, uh, U.S. federal grant recipients who okay. get money to go see, do a lot of international development work overseas, you know, throughout Africa and other parts of the world. And um, and so we're working with them here through their, their D.C. office or the New York office or whatnot. And then um, a lot of times they're, you know, engaged in activities, uh, you name it, uh, in various countries around the world. And uh, these days, for instance, the federal government is really cracking down on procurement practices. So mm. federal money goes overseas. You're going to go you know, try to feed the poor, eradicate disease, do whatever the case may be. And you have to hire people. You have to buy product. You have to do other things. There's not surprisingly a lot of abuse in that area. There's a yeah. lot of people taking advantage overseas, of the situation. Overseas, having yeah. to and, uh, the wheels a little bit to do the business uh, you want to do. And, right. and there's laws like the uh, Foreign Corrupt Practices Act. They don't let you do federal that. Federal law that says company, yeah, you yeah. grease the wheels and you can go to jail here in this country for doing that overseas. Mm-hmm. In the law wow. world, my, my dad used to say uh, lawyers can be really bad business people sometimes. And because his, his, and his analogy was until they brought a management consultant in, he told me all this, was um, like, do you have to bring in a certain amount of billable hours? And then when you have that, if you're not, it, but if you're not marketing, then you're not bringing in the billable hours. But if you're not if you're working on a project and you're not marketing, if you're marketing, then you're at b- the billable hours. Yeah. It, so it, is that a big firm? Do they have a whole marketing department with that chase? Uh, they don't chase ambulances. What do they chase? Association. Well, uh, we, we do have a terrific marketing department. So that's insane. So shout out to Camille, who's a phenomenal uh, marketing Go Camille. Uh, coordinator, specialist, manager who works with me. But um, – no, so is that the, a quagmire? No, the well, it can be, and the answer really varies depending on what level you are. Mm-hmm. So, particularly at big firms and even at smaller firms, I remember from the smaller firm I started out at, um, as you might gather from what I've already said, I've always been very big on business development. Yeah. So right out of the gate, first year, second year, third year associate, I'm writing all these articles and giving speeches and taking people to lunch, and it affected my billable hours, and I always got. You know, kind of hey, a little gold bit, stars. little bit raked over the coals. But they're saying you're doing such a great job, growing the profile and bringing in business, but you're not meeting your billable mm, hours. Right. Um, you know, and, and I, I just took my lumps, but realized, at least thought I realized, and it turned out to be right that I was on that on that right path. And then when you get to the point where you're bringing in enough business, then the billable hours become much less important because you're generating a lot of business for the firm. If you just think about the economics, but when you're an associate in particular, and even when you're beyond that, a counsel or partner, if you're not generating a lot of business, then you have to have the billable hours. And the general rule of thumb in most firms, especially the bigger firms, is that your compensation is going to be – like whatever you're billing and whatever that translates to dollar-wise, and generally you're going to be able to earn – how do I put it? If you're – let's say your compensation was – just raw numbers. I don't make anything. One hundred fifty thousand dollars a year. Um, y- y- you you have to be y- you have to be generating one hundred fifty thousand dollars a year in order to get paid fifty thousand dollars a year. I had it backwards. Okay, and, and the other the times. other two thirds is going to Just, overhead. Is going yeah. to partner profits and everything else. And and that's the general way that it works. But if you're not at least billing three you times know, that, your that that three times, then you're not going to be paying for yourself. And that's why the billable hours are, are so critical. And it's frankly really hard. 
to be successful as an, as an associate in any large firm uh, without having those billable hours and in many small firms too. But it's also t- tough because you're sort of in a problem solving spot, right? You're w- once you solve the problem, once you've re- re- you know rewrote the employee handbook and modernized it, then you know there might be a dip, and then the amount well, actually, of what they need. for for some work? people, like for litigators, for instance, and, and I've had this conversation with many litigators over the year. These are people that go into court and litigate disputes. Often, you know, generally when they're done, the, when that matter is resolved, however it's resolved, it's done. And then unless you have some ongoing stream of litigation, you're not going to be able to keep doing work for that client, at least on a regular basis. Right. For us, it's very different because we generally serve as either general counsel or outside general counsel. So we're dealing with all of these issues all of the time. And even once the employee handbook is rewritten, and then maybe we do some training to the staff to help them there's implement so it. Other but there's so many other things going on. I and we have 700 clients now, so we have a pretty massive Somebody's in trouble at some so, point. <laughs> and well, it's not just trouble. In fact, most of it's not trouble. Most of it is it's, keeping them out of trouble. It's right, mitigating risk. Yeah, stuff. Gotcha. It's reviewing contracts. It's reviewing policies. It's doing trainings for board members, for staff. You know, It's all of that stuff. Do most lawyers know that getting out of law school? That, that Yeah, that's great that you're a, you're a fancy great lawyer, but you also you know, you got to bring in the bill, bring in the clients? Is that a, a, shock? a lot of people realize that that's one of the reasons that some people go in house. And I, I've known many people over the years who have gone from private practice in a law firm to in house positions. In fact, the only people we that have ever left our kind of core practice, kind of those generalists, we have about thirty now who do nothing but work day in and day out with nonprofits. The only ones that ever left us left to go in house to other positions at, a, at an association. Uh, thank God, knock on wood, never went to uh, you know a competitor or whatnot. Uh, but a lot of them left because it was just a better fit. Lifestyle ways. It, it, it's probably the only downside of my job is having to keep track of all of those hours. It's not so much the pressure to bill the hours. Not anymore, uh, anyway. Uh, well, not for me, at least. But for a lot of lawyers, that's a lot of pressure. Uh, it's a lot of um, it's constant, you know. Especially in our practice, the way we work, um, where every lawyer is typically dealing with at least ten different clients on a day. I'm dealing with thirty or thirty-five different clients. You got to keep track of all of those phone calls, all of those emails, all of the. You know, work product that you're reviewing, and it's uh, it's, it's a lot of time and effort, and and in some ways, going in house while the um, compensation generally isn't going to be the same. Sure, it's a lot that of is ten else. different projects or ten different animals you're dealing with. You're like, oh, there's one. One well, organization. one organization. Right. Generally, in-house lawyers have to be jacks of all trades as right. well. Once they, like we're just talking like a coach about earlier. Or to me, though, you couldn't. I wouldn't trade for anything the variety that I get from working with so many, so many different clients, so many industries, so many professions, issues, causes, and so many different legal issues. To oh. me, that's one of the things that's so stimulating. How do you, so how, I'll be retired. how do you yeah. go at this level now where you're at now? How do you do, what's the business development you know, process like for you? Like what happens? Well, for us, we have the uh, right now the largest nonprofit law practice in the country, but you wouldn't know it by the way that we kind of deal with business development. We have never been more active um, than ever before. Uh, one thing that I started about six years ago, um, I had always done, and a lot of us in our group had done a lot of speaking at ASAE conferences okay. and webinars and other things, but one way, we right? wanted to be able to really control the process more. So we started a monthly series, a monthly program that we do. We offer free lunch in our D.C. office, oh, 12 to 1230. And then you guys can come anytime, 1230 <laughs> to 2 p.m. Eastern. We have a, a live program on every conceivable nonprofit and association legal topic that you can think of. So and we do a live webinar that goes along with that we uh, and anyone can participate. No limit on participation. It's all free. And then we also record all of those and host them on a YouTube channel. Those programs have grown massively in the last six years. They've become very popular. Um, We usually get about 100 people in the room every month for lunch, and we get Mm, anywhere from 250 to 500 people on the phone every month. And then a lot of people that um, listen in later. And you choose the topic, and you say, this this week's going to be contracts. Well, it's once a month. But, yeah, that takes, as you can imagine, a lot of time and effort. Not just to do them, but to do them right, to come up with the hot topics, line up the speakers, come up with a good title and description. 
subscription that's catchy and what to eat for lunch um, every <laughs> month one. every month you know have calls with the speakers to get them lined up and orchestrate the program then I moderate all the programs you, you know and as you guys know from being in your business kind of keeping it going keeping it interesting posing questions interjecting is really important to making these things successful but that's something that we've done that has been very effective in bringing new clients to us, making them aware of what we do, but also in growing our relationships with existing clients because they see all of the different areas that we work in that they might not have realized or realize they have issues that they didn't think about before. Plus, I bet for you is also a time to like reflect upon, well, these topics, the bigger picture, the getting out of the day-to-day grind of solving problems for the clients and under, trying to understand that, them. That, that is very true because it does right. force you to kind of look bigger picture on, you know, what are some of the trends and our topic this month has to do with uh, copyright uh, protection and uh, infringement uh, overseas, particularly in some trouble spot countries. Right. So I can come out there, get an hour maybe of a free talk, five minutes of free advice, and then uh, and then and you get to be exposed to you guys. Yeah, and it's actually. I don't know if you've realized this because you guys focus primarily on associations. I think on your show, but. As we've really grown our practice beyond the association world, which is where we really started, that's all it was in the beginning. I came from there, a guy named George Constantine, who followed me at ASIE, he came over, and and we've been, that's where our focus was primarily in the beginning. But now that we've branched out, if you, it's interesting, when you come to these luncheons, the room is about half association people and half other types of nonprofits. And there aren't really, I found, any other conferences, gatherings, events out there that had that unique combination of all of those folks. The nonprofit world tends to be segregated right, the different right, types of right, categories right. And, and this is something that brings them together and I purposely select topics that cross over you know both between sides. And, both sides exactly uh, that's that's a good that, I Woo. think that's the right strategy so you got to do that with your radio <laughs> well, well we, do. we do we do we bring in we brought in charities we brought in some we've had Carpenter's Shelter Peace Corps all kinds of we have yeah exactly. uh, Martha's uh, Table and a few others and, and yeah the they, they have obviously there is a number of ish, areas and issues where it's very different from the association donors world, and grants a lot where there's sim- uh, right. like similarities foundations donors and grant managing yeah. donors managing grants uh, and then NGOs uh, yeah. I feel like we're doing the beginning of the show NGOs right, right. <laughs> <laughs> but you're right. You kind of we we did. I think we do lean a little bit more with this. this is just sort of the space that I've sort of been in over yeah, the exactly. years, and so you just kind of it's. But you got to expand. You got to kind of look around. I mean, it's still a nonprofit. It's still doing creating a service. Or how would you describe that? Yeah. How would you? Describe well, the it? the way that I usually describe the difference between so when you think of a charity, you think of a, a non association nonprofit. Most tend to be exempt from federal corporate income tax under a section 501c3 and the vast majority of nonprofits out there are federally tax exempt under c3 um, trade and professional associations are exempt under section 501c6 <laughs> the primary difference uh, if you had to boil it down, is that C3s have to primarily benefit the general public. Okay. Not every person in the general public, but some broad enough segment of the general public. That has to be the primary benefit. There can be benefit to individuals, companies, even in industry, but it has to be secondary and incidental to the primary public benefit. Whereas with associations under C6, the primary benefit is going to an industry or a profession, okay. not to the general public. Now, don't keep in mind, too, that a lot of associations maybe even the majority, have the larger ones, have a related foundation. Basic, right? it's we call it a related foundation that's exempt under C3 that they typically control, um, but is engaged in other kind of publicly facing activities. Hmm. Want to play a game? I think we're ready. I think we're ready to play the yeah, word association for game. Thanks for Boy. swinging by and giving us a little view of Venable. We'll get to the thing. Let's go. Oh, let's get into it. So, is, uh, so first thing that hold comes. Hold on, hold on. we got a word association game is what we're playing. This segment is sponsored by Charity Engine. Yeah. Thank you, Charity Engine. <laughs> Charity Engine is a CRM, and that stands for a what, Ernesto? Customer Relationship Management System. So, yeah, what it does, is, and it's specially made for nonprofits, and that's what's really slick about this, because nonprofits, um, there's a lot of options out there, but none specifically made for you. So if you're a nonprofit, check out Charity Engine. They have all the tools to put on a run, like a, a physical run, like the, the little marathon. run for the cure type thing. They have fundraising aspects to that. Yeah, yeah, fundraising. They have this cool map where you can see who's donated and they see if the people can open the email, when they open it, how they opened it. 
where they came from, how they came to your website. All this stuff is integrated in one package, so you don't have to have the Drupal and the uh, the MailChimp and the this and the that and this. I mean, you can have all that, and it will it'll take all the data from that and plop it into Charity Engine and give you this amazing report, right? Yeah, so if That's you're in the market of doing something new with your website and you also want to get rid of your old database that doesn't never integrated well, then put these guys on your list because this might be a good option to check out. Check out the Charity Engine at charityengine.net. All right. First thing comes to your mind when we say partners. Oh my <laughs> he's, God. He's squirming in his chair. <laughs> trying to find a non-legalistic technical answer. You know, we always say... Uh, squirming. Sometimes your contract... People will look at someone and say, "Let's." You can't use the word "partner" because it means that I'm liable for what you're doing. Oh you're God! For what I Paul do. is here now. Paul yeah. is with us. You have to be a member. That's not what you want to get at. Uh, I'll say law firm partner. Okay. Law all firm. right. All right. Um, mm, let's see. Uh, billable hours. <laughs> uh, That's it. Oh. Bane, bane of my existence. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Uh, let's see. Business development. Uh, whatever the the opposite of being in my existence. Look at you. It lights up when you say that. So you should hang out afterwards and talk uh, business development. How about um, risk mitigation? Pretty much everything we do. That's what you do. Arbitration. Uh, not much different than litigation. No? Mm. Well, you have to say one word, though. Uh, <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. Regulations. Um... One word? That could be a phrase. Well, you know, we, this is a loose We don't show. have a contract or anything here. <laughs> no, uh... These are not... Come on, you could have given me for interesting <laughs> things. <laughs> these, All right. These stink. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> How about, um... Let's see. Um, all right, um, the Eagles. Not going to the Super Bowl yet this year, but on the right track. <laughs> How about, um... Carson fa- wins. Foundations. Every association should have one. Every association should have one. All right. Well, hold on. I'm going to give him the one that we'll wrap it up with. Venable. Greatest firm on the planet. Law firm. All right. <laughs> it's tough. The word association game is tough. It is Let tough. Let me tell you. Like uh, he was in the hot seat. I admire your spot. You know, you know what would be another fun game I should do someday? I'll, I'll we can do it right now. bring a list of all of our clients, but I'll just bring the acronyms. Oh, yeah, that's it. You can try it. You have to guess who they are. Put the music on. <laughs> FDRA. You know that one? That's probably not. No, I don't know. That How about one. NACS or NAX? The National Association of Convenience? Yeah! Nice. <laughs> Shout out to our... Not to be confused with the National Association of Chain Drug Stores right down the street. <laughs> oh, oh, really? You should call them up. NACDS. <laughs> Jeff, this was cool. Uh, this is awesome. Thanks for coming by and giving us a little peek into the into your world. Um, if Blake and I get in trouble, you're on yeah, speed dial. Who do we call? Where call me. I'll be here. You'll well, be how here. do we get in touch? What's the website here? That was the tease. See, that was the uh, setup. Venable.com slash nonprofits. Venable.com. And you can go out once a month and eat food on Jeff and learn Absolutely. about. Absolutely. When you go to that site, actually, you can sign up for our mailing list if you want to get invited to our luncheons. It's lobster and uh, <laughs> filet mignon. <laughs> Every month. Every month. Tom Perignon's flowing. Yeah, we, we serve some really good red and white wine, too. Red and white wine. So you'll be there. All the executives are now going to be there. Let's get a little education. That's, I think it's great. I think it's a good idea. It's fun. Yeah. Jeff, it's thanks fun. for sleeping. You, you can look at it on the YouTube, too. You can. Well, that's right. Um, YouTube.com slash Venable Nonprofit. So you can get hours of entertaining legal speak. Legal speak. It's very stimulating. And if you really want to get stimulated, <laughs> and or if you have trouble stimulating at night, you, you can buy this really exciting book I wrote called Association Tax Compliance Guide. Ooh. It's a real uh, Okay. <laughs> you should get together with Ron Barrett. <laughs> yeah, I should get him. You should get Ron right Barrett and him on yeah, together. Should. That's a good idea, actually. That would be cool. We'll tell you about yeah. that after the show. Maybe we'll make that happen. Yeah. Okay. All right. Thanks Thank a lot. You guys. Thank Appreciate you. It was fun. Now, if you, you, not you and 
Gusto, not you, Jeff. But if you are listening to this and you know amazing people like Jeff that are helping to save the world, the nonprofit world, whatever it is, do gooders, foundations, or just a great person in general, maybe you want to be known in the number no, nominated. nominated. <laughs> yeah, just go, go to through the noise.us website. There's a form there. Contact us. Drop in three lines. Why you should be on the show? Or three well, lines. This person should Someone be. Someone told show. us to do that on a previous yeah. episode. Uh, I think that's a good idea. Through the noise. Yeah, that's a lot. US. Through the Noise is produced by Ernesto Gutzman. Audio engineer, Blake Alpin. Voiceover, Paula Belnois. Assistant producer is Stephanie Latour. And online copywriter is Lolly Walsh. Ha. All right, I'm out of here. Okay, see ya. All right, this is a special time between you and me. There's no one here else to bother us, so we can. Oh, oh, hey. How's it going? Mickey, our, the IT genius and guru behind Human Factor Media, Through the Noise, and Famia, a bunch of stuff. The IT guy. I, I like genius better than guru. Genius. I, I'm, I'm, I'm undecided between genius and guru. <laughs> okay. And you bring a bag of stuff. Yeah. What are we <laughs> it's our mailbag. <laughs> it's our mailbag of problems. It's, it's the list of naughty. IT problems. List of naughty clients. Yeah. So... We have an, uh, uh, he'll pull one out here. We have an Allison, and she wrote in and said, um, my host says they back up my server. Uh, why should I do, what should I do, or why should I pay for separate backups for my website? That's interesting. That is interesting. Hmm. And we get that question a lot because my, uh, our services uh, our managed services generally include backups because we like to back up the websites individually. And our clients say, well, you know, my host, is it host monster or uh, Rackspace, whoever it is, they provide server-wide backups. And there's a couple of problems with the server-wide backups. Number one is there are a lot of times server-wide backups and server-wide restores. So if you have multiple websites and one of them goes down and gets hacked, then you realize it five days later, then you lose five days of content for all of your websites, which have had that happen. Another mm -hmm. one is a lot of those server-wide backups rely on a server agent. Uh, an agent is basically a small... Uh, a small program that runs on the server. Like a robot. Exactly. Like a little... <laughs> a little, a little code robot. Yeah, a little code robot. It's just there and sends all the files to the backup server. And if the, uh, if the agent stops working for some reason, you won't really know until you try to restore the backup and, uh, and it's not there. Uh, another reason is a lot of times on well, the, the database side of things, uh, the server backups will not do what's called a lock table database dump. Uh, and there's many is, reasons. And what is that? Log table database dump? Well, that's that's a long explanation. I don't know if I'll have time to go into that. But I do have a uh, – I'll, I'll write all that up with a couple of details and thoughts on, on the web. So you can throw it on the web and go look at it there. Okay. Uh, go to where? Through the noise.us slash backups. Sure. We'll and I will go there. We'll describe kind of the, the different reasons. And, you know, all the server-side backup problems are individually addressable. It's not like if you can't do it. But it's a lot easier and quicker to just have a, 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 I'm sorry, a website backup that you can just throw up there. If you need to move to a server to somewhere else, if your server suddenly goes upside down, if the server if the server gets hacked uh, or your server provider gets hacked, um, there's a lot of issues that you know. It's just nice to have backups in multiple places. So yeah, we'll go to uh, to through the noise.us slash backups. I've, I've found that um, sometimes like clients that have had old websites running for a long time and they just assume that the backup service is running and doing the backups and then you kind of look when you, you know, something goes bad and then you look into it and you're like, wait a minute, the backup wasn't really running yeah. the way we expected it. We didn't have daily or weekly or monthly we had this one quarterly thing or yeah, this yeah. old mm -hmm. backup service got somehow. How do you like go about checking backups that they're being done properly? Do you have like a, a period, a, like a method to that? We can always download them and extract them. Hmm, that's the best way, right? To yeah. feed, how can you extract the backup? Yeah. You don't want to be scrambling to extract the backup for the first time, right? 
Well, on it when there's an emergency of getting your website up. Yeah, it'd be nice to do that you know, on a yearly or quarterly basis, make sure it makes it work. So you can also, the other thing that, that people confuse is, is backups with archives. You know, a lot of times they say, well, I had this file back in 93. Uh, it was on my website. Do you, do you backups have it? And a lot of times we think of backups as, as emergency recovery tools, not necessarily data archival tools. And archiving data and, data and, and archive management and document management is a whole different conversation. But generally backups will go back to maybe a month. Um, we'll have a daily backup for a week, a weekly backup for a month, and that's about it. So hopefully a month is long enough to realize you know, if something goes down, your website crashes or your, your, you know, your web host goes bankrupt, we can use one of the backups to get you back up right away. But a lot of times the issue is not so much that something crashed, it's that your website got hacked and we need to restore from a backup, and we don't really know when it got hacked. That gets tricky, right, because so, then the backups could be backing up the hack. Correct. All the way yeah. back to however long. It yeah, so you need to go back to about about a month, I think, is what we do. So if, hopefully within a month we'll figure out, Google or someone will figure out that the website's been hacked and can go back far enough to do that. Yeah, because sometimes those hacks sort of lay dormant, right? They don't really announce, they don't start changing things on the server immediately to make it uh, like an easy thing to see like most people when they get a, a website hack they just look at their website and something's on their website that shouldn't be there and that's sort of the alerting <laughs> moment of like what what happened here but yeah a, a lot of them so that we have hacks where you know russian or or syrian or whatever hackers gone into a website and defamed the website so these defamation hacks are easy to see and we usually get alerts because you know when we monitor the website we monitor for a specific string to to match so if that if the site gets defaced, usually that string isn't there, and our systems alert us that the site is is down. Ah, that's right? monitoring stuff. Gotcha. Right. See, there's more. Mm. We can talk about hacking. We can talk about all sorts of things Scanning here related to backups. Uh, but a lot of times there is this kind of black hat SEO type of hacks where they basically try to insert links to. For some reason, it's usually either like drugs, like Viagra, or or, <laughs> or fake watches. You know, all these sites that sell this this nefarious stuff. And they just insert links into the website in such a way that you can't see it. And the idea behind that is that even though you can cannot see it, Google and all the other search, search engines, engines can, can yeah. see it. So they they use that to gain authority for their spammy page by uh, by basically hacking your site. Hmm. And you can't see those, right? Those those types of hacks. You go to your website, you don't know that they exist until Google says. Hey, uh, Fred, your website is hacked. We found that your website yeah. has been pointing bad links. Which, of course, means you have, to, you have to have your website hooked in with Google Search Console so that people... Mm. Yeah, there's a lot of stuff that goes into there. That I might have know. to be for another bonus. <laughs> yeah, so we already to... got two bonus <laughs> content pieces right there. We've got three, I think, with it. but we'll start with the backups on this one, and then we'll, maybe we can uh, next Expand time... Expand on that? Yeah, next okay. time we can talk about hacking and... Uh, so we'll stuff we'll that in the through the noise us slash backups. Backups plural, right? Yeah. Yeah, it sounds good. All right, Mickey, thanks, man. No Thanks problem, for man. by. Let's get on the boat. Let's get yeah, out of here. Yeah, yeah, you know the good thing about a boat is when you fall off, you don't get a, a road rash. Oh, yeah. Not like a bike situation. <laughs> yeah. That's what sailing's about, huh? Uh, yeah. <laughs> you might you might get jellyfish thing. <laughs> Everything has a hazard. Thanks, Mickey. So you're Bye, everybody. Boom!